Hi everyone, welcome to this um, lecture on agriculture for AP Environmental Science. This one's going to be a long one because we're tackling many different um, learning objectives that all have to do with agriculture. So rather than splitting this um, into multiple PowerPoints, I'm just going to do one PowerPoint that we'll talk about in two class periods or at home um, over the course of a couple days. So we're going to look at topic 5.3, the Green Revolution, um, 5.4, Impacts of Agriculture. And you guys will see that the enduring understanding for both of those has basically the same as what we've been talking about all this unit. We're going to be looking at irrigation methods, production of meat, pest control, and we're going to interweave sustainable practices throughout this whole lecture. The vocab is up here, and like usual, I'm going to skip it. So first off, what is agriculture? Agriculture is just the practice of cultivating plants and raising animals, and we typically think about it as um, a food source, right? But in the strict sense, it is. In the broad sense, though, you can raise um, animals and you can raise crops for other things, say sheep for wool or, um, you know, uh, cotton for cotton fibers. Okay. Um, agriculture has arisen independently in many cultures around the world at least six times, probably several times more than that, um, anywhere between 13,000 and 5,000 years ago. So it has arisen independently across many different cultures. But this isn't really a history of agriculture um, lecture. This is really the environmental impacts of modern agriculture. But to understand modern agriculture a little bit more, let's compare it to just um, the year 1900 in the US. The average American farmer in 1900 could feed their family plus about 12 more people. Okay, so you definitely had people living in the cities, people living in towns that were not involved in the agricultural process because these farmers were feeding them. But we need a lot more farmers on the farm than we had today. Most of these farms had over a dozen plant and animal species, right? This is before mechanization or at least large scale mechanization um, with internal combustion engines. So much of, um, much of the labor was done by animals. So you had horses, oxen, mules, donkeys on the farm. You had pretty much every farm would have poultry, chickens, ducks, or geese or whatever. And you would have several different species of plants. You'd probably have a large field of hay or barley or oats or corn, some type of grain. But then you'd also have probably an orchard and a family garden to just feed your family, right? And you'd have dozens of species of plants alone in that garden. And one out of every four Americans lived on farms. So about a quarter of the U.S. population lived on farms. If we contrast that with the year 2000, the average American farmer feeds about 129 people. This means that there is way fewer people living on farms, about 2 million Americans today. And recall that the U.S. population um, rounded down is about 330 million people. So that's a very small proportion of that, um, of the total population. Okay. And most farms are just exclusively corn and soy. Many farms obviously grow vegetables. That's the only way that we're gonna get vegetables is by um, farmers raising them. Farmers will also just have maybe dairy cows, okay? And that's all that they do is just dairy cows. Um, but many of the farms are just a couple species. Okay, so very different agricultural practices and, all, and, and these practices, especially this one, um, lead to environmental impacts, negative environmental impacts that we'll talk about. But there's also definitely the positive societal impacts of that, right? You and I do not have to toil on the farms because, um, you know, the farmers are feeding lots and lots of peoples that can live in the cities, the suburbs, etc. All right. And this modern agricultural system that I just discussed is a product of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is really important because it improved crop yields worldwide. And it is, um, although it started in the 1950s and 1960s, really the 1950s, um, it's still an ongoing process. We're still living with the effects and expanding on the Green Revolution. Okay, um, It started on Mexican land, Mexican farms, um, funded jointly by the U.S. government and the Mexican government, as well as the United Nations, the World Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation, and lots of other groups. Okay, um, These were just the major contributors. And it, the main purpose of this was to scientifically improve crops, kind of taking the, um, taking the artificial selection that's gone on in fields from the dawn of agriculture 
out of the hands of just purely farmers, but and putting it more in the hands of scientists and scientist farmers. Okay. Um, there was a ton of people involved in this, but the one that you guys need to know is Norman Borlaug, who is pictured in the bottom right. And because of his work in this, um, he's credited with saving over a billion people from starvation since the 1950s, um, 1960s, and consequently won the Nobel Peace Prize. You don't need to know a lot about him, but you might see that name. And we'll come back to a quote um, from him later on in this PowerPoint. Okay. The Green Revolution really um, focused on grains because most of the world's population is fed with grains. You will also see the term cereals for grains. Um, those are interchangeable, okay, synonyms. Okay, so when we're talking about grains, what we're talking about are grasses that produce um, a seed, a kernel that we eat. We're talking about wheat, barley, oats, rice, corn. Corn, you will also see called maize. That's the technical term for corn. I'll typically use the word corn, but I'll often use the word maize as well. Okay. What we did was, or what the Green Revolution um, created was new high yield varieties that um, were a product of selective breeding. And you may know selective breeding from biology class as artificial selection. So you probably, or you should have talked about artificial selection in biology, where it is um, selection under human pressure, or selection under, um, under humans, selection by humans. We find the traits, um, or we select for the traits that we find desirable in our domesticated plants and animals, and we breed for those traits and to um, exaggerate those traits, to make those traits bigger, better, whatever. And then high yield varieties. This means that we're producing two to four times the amount um, of product of cereal grain per acre or per hectare rather. Same thing as per acre, but science class we're using hectares. All right. And many of these are hybrids. We don't have to go too far into hybrids, but hybrids are essentially you have um, an F1 hybrid between two different um, two different strains, two different varieties, two different, um, yeah, two different varieties. And that produces a super great variety that can only really be used that one generation because the next, because if you saved seed from it, it would be too genetically variable and you wouldn't get so much of a, um, as a great of a yield. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this one bullet point. What you really should know is that we did artificial selection, selective breeding to produce high yield varieties, varieties that produce way more than the traditional varieties that we had previous, previously, okay? But the Green Revolution wasn't just about um, development of these new high yield varieties. Simultaneously, this is um, you know after World War II, simultaneously we have um, new irrigation practices starting and the widespread adoption of, ir of these irrigation practices. Um, after the World War II, huge boom in synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides and defoliants. Mechanization because, you know, internal combustion engines and larger tractors, combines, trailers, whatever, um, were created. And then much later on in the 1990s and 2000s, the introduction of GM crops, so genetically modified organism crops. Okay. All of this resulted in increases in the amount of food that we were able to produce on the same amount of land, not to mention the land that we are currently or have been um, deforesting or converting from grassland to, um, to uh, agricultural fields. Okay, so this led to growing food security for the world population. So let's just talk about some positive and negative effects of the Green Revolution. Um, the some positive effects. First off, food security is huge. Um, the Green Revolution, like I said a couple slides ago, has been credited with um, saving over a billion people worldwide from starvation. That is mostly due to these high yield varieties. Look at the size of an individual wheat kernel on the right versus the ancestral wheat kernels on the left, right? Just by having larger kernels, we can get more per plant than we were able to before. Much of that is due to what they call dwarf varieties. If you guys look at um, old pictures of peasants and medieval fields in Europe, you'll notice that the wheat that they're cutting down is as tall as they are, right? This is probably six foot tall wheat. Those are um, ancient varieties or ancestral varieties.
much of the energy of the plant went into vegetative growth, meaning um, growth of the stalk, okay, of the of the plant um, body, rather than the seed itself. These dwarf varieties, maybe being two to three feet tall, most most of that energy that would be going into producing an additional three feet of stem and leaf is now going into seed production. So you get these big fat seeds, these big fat wheat kernels um, that are improving the yield of your crop simply, um, simply by making the seeds larger. All right, so you're producing more per plant on the same amount of land. Okay, so what we have now are dwarf varieties that are um, super big uh, seeds. Anyway, I digress. Um, today, about the, about um, you, you consume about 25% more calories than the average person in the developed world before the Green Revolution. So a huge amount of, um, very, very significant. Now this has some negative health effects as well. Um, obesity, um, cardiovascular diseases, etc. However, it is good that we have food security. We have increased efficiency, so this is great. Um, that increased efficiency has freed much of the labor force away from agriculture, right? You and I do not have to toil in the fields harvesting wheat by hand using a scythe, right? Um, so that leads to more people moving into the cities, into the suburbs, finding jobs outside of agriculture. And I hate to use the term progress, but I will use it here, progressing society um, into the you know, digital age that we're in today, right? It's in, it's increased um, the upper, uh, the middle class worldwide, which has um, decreased the amount of poverty and facilitated human rights as well, because we don't need that agricultural labor as much. But with everything, there is negative um, results of it as well. And because this is environmental science and we're looking at the negative impacts on the environment, we're going to focus on the negatives pretty much throughout the rest of this um, lecture, but talking about ways that we can improve it and solutions for those negative um, problems. Okay, one of them overpopulation, right? Food security, you're preventing people from starving. That means that there's more people living. That means that there's a growing human population and the human population has grown by about 5 billion since 1960. All right, so we have you know, gone from about 3 billion to about 5, uh, sorry, to about 8 billion people, added about 5 billion since um, 1960. Sorry, you just heard the bell go off. Um, like I said before, this greater caloric intake means that we have an increase in, um, in uh, negative health effects from, um, you know, cheap, readily available, high carb diets. Think fast food, okay? Or think the snack food that people eat, uh, what I like to call edible food-like substances. Um, I did not come up with that term that I credit, I credit it um, to Michael Pollan. Um, we rely on just a few crops. We'll talk about that um, when we talk about genetic variability and we've already talked about that before, but um, Today, we rely on only a few types of corn. Corn is one of the most variable of, um, of our agricultural crops, and there is so much variety in these old ancient varieties. This is one variety or one land race that produces all of this different variety in the kernels. And think about how much nutrition is probably represented in those different colors, because you know pigments in many cases in plants are nutrients um, for us, okay? Um, I don't know if you can see it, but the white sweet corn that you eat at the store has very, very little nutrients compared to um, either blue, purple, red, or yellow corn. Okay, so if you buy white sweet corn, it's almost devoid of nutrients other than sugar. Okay, so we rely on only a few food crops that not only reduces our nutrient value, which um, I mentioned here, but also means that we're losing these ancient varieties. Okay, they are going, these ancient heirloom or um, land race varieties are going extinct. Okay, and then we have the potential use for widespread unsustainable practices, which we will talk about a lot, and that is causing environmental degradation. So I'm going to break this all down um, basically as the learning objectives do that. So we're going to go through each one of these um, individually. Starting with irrigation, you guys have seen this diagram before. Um, this diagram shows how little fresh water there is on the planet. 
right? Only about 2.5% of all the water on the planet is fresh water. But of that 2.5%, a little more than two thirds of it is unavailable for use because it's locked in ice. A lot of it, about a third, a little less than a third is groundwater and surface water represents only about 1.2% of 2.5%. So a very, very small amount of water is in lakes, rivers, swamps and marshes, etc. Okay, this water right here is what is available for, uh, for irrigation use. The water in ice caps and glaciers is not available for irrigation use. Okay, the only way that it would be is if it melts, but even if it melts, it's going to, um, if it's a landlocked glacier, it's probably going to melt into a river, which will eventually flow into the ocean, or if it's on a coastal glacier or ice sheet or um, ice cap, it's going to melt directly into the ocean, in which case it's not available for use. Eventually, the melting ice is going into the ocean and just making the oceans increase, which is not irrigable water. Okay, you can't use it for irrigation. So global warming and melting of ice caps and glaciers is not a solution to increase the amount of fresh water available for irrigating crops or for human consumption. But again, I digress. So irrigation is the artificial application of water to land for crop purposes. What I mean by artificial is that it is not precipitation. It is humans putting water onto the land. Okay. Um, this is the largest use of water that we use. Okay, it's not for human consumption. It's um, like the largest use of water on the planet is not for human consumption or industry or toilets. It's for agriculture. And there's four types that we're going to talk about, but there are several others that exist and two others that we will talk about as well. All right, so the first one is furrow irrigation. This is where you plow um, ridges and furrows into um, into your field. You plant your plants up on the ridges. So we have our plants up on the ridge. Maybe I'll do green for plants. And then in the furrows, you have water that can flow through, as you can see in the picture on the bottom. Okay, so this is a plowing technique as well as a irrigation technique. Okay, um, those furrows again are periodically filled with water. As they are filled with water, the, so the surrounding soil of the ridge absorbs much of, or some of that water enough for plant growth. The source of that water can, is pretty variable. Um, if it's coming from a natural source, it will be a river or stream, and many of those rivers or streams are um, have canals that come off of them. So people have dug canals from the river. They will um, block that canal until they want to flood, um, flood their field, or not flood their field, but provide irrigation water for their field, open the canal, river water flows through the canal, um, into their field and then probably most of the time from one field to the next field to the next field because this water is all going this direction and all flowing and this like downhill and probably to the next field downhill okay and then you can also pump it up from groundwater but that is not quite as often used for this although still heavily often um, heavily used. This is very inexpensive, very effective. This is one of the older methods of irrigation. And because it doesn't rely on any types of pumps, if you are using um, canals and streams and rivers, because it's all flowing downhill. And it's easy to do. This is very ancient technique. It does lead to a lot of water loss, though. About a third of the water runs off or evaporates. So that's water that is not being um, used, so this would be considered inefficient. Okay, um, this increases the runoff because those um, furrows are often parallel to the predominant slope because they have to be moving downhill. So if they're parallel to the predominant slope, then that allows that water to move through it and maybe move through it rather quickly and obviously picking up sediment along the way with it. So any loose soil, and you can see that there is a lot of loose soil in this picture down at the bottom right, can erode away. As these, um, these are not always filled with water. In fact, most of the time they're not filled with water. As the soil dries out between waterings, it can lead to um, wind erosion as well. Okay, and this is typically used in farms. This is typically large scale um, operations, okay, or at least larger than your home garden, okay, but often used in um, agricultural fields.
our second method is flood irrigation. This um, is exactly what it sounds like. You just flood a field. So rather than having the ridges and furrows like the last time, you basically have a flat field. And you flood it either once or several times um, during, the during the growing season. Okay, some crops such as uh, rice like to be flooded during um, uh, for, for a, a rather long period of time and then only during the vegetative stage of growth. Okay, this can lead to what we call waterlogged soils. A soil is waterlogged when it becomes saturated um, with water long enough for anaerobic decomposition or anaerobic soil organisms to predominate. Okay, so whenever you see the term anaerobic, think organisms that produce methane. Um, they're not only going to produce methane, there's many types of anaerobic um, bacteria and fungi, but um, the, for this class, whenever you see anaerobic, think methane production. And in fact, rice fields or rice paddies is one of the leading causes of methane emissions from agriculture. Not nearly as much as cattle, but still a large one. In fact, it's the largest plant-based um, emitter of methane because of these waterlogged soils. Plant roots can become deprived of oxygen, which can lead to root rot and, root rot and plant death. Um, rice is an exception. It is a marsh plant, so it likes those waterlogged soils. That's what it's adapted to. Um, depending on the situation, sorry about the bell again, um, this can raise the water table. Now, that can be a good or a bad thing, and a ra rather arid area that can be good but if it's a um, very wet area that could be bad because that raised water table can lead to um, more flooding in the event of a heavy rain the soil can't absorb as much water if the water table is high so it really depends um, and then like i said methane now this can be used like i said once to many times in the growing season rice is probably going to be flooded um, one time but for a long period of time. This picture on the top right is from the San Luis Valley near Alamosa of a barley field that is um, going through flood irrigation and that barley field um, is only going to be flooded once at the very beginning of the season and that will be enough water for that relatively drought resistant barley to go through the entire summer and mature. Okay so it really just depends. Right. Um, again this is going to be in agricultural fields. It's used primarily with growing rice, but also with growing other cereals, including barley. You can do this in your orchards with fruit trees. You can also do this with some types of vegetables. Okay. Um, so when you see flood irrigation, I would typically think rice, but think that it, but do know that it can happen in other crops as well. Now spray irrigation is our next one. This is probably what you thought of when I said irrigation, you probably thought of the sprinkler in your front yard because that is a classic example of spray irrigation. Um, these um, rings or these circle circular fields you've probably seen flying in the air. Um, if you've ever had a window seat when you fly, uh, you've probably seen these in the American West. They are very common and becoming more and more common around the, around the world. What you have is a central pivot irrigation system where you have a pump and a uh, pipe that is bringing water up from the ground or from whatever your source is right here. So that pump has to be stationary. And then you have these really long spray arms on wheels that spin around in a circle. So each one of these you see essentially like a little clock hand that is um, going from the center out to the very edge and creating this radius as it wheels around spraying as it goes. And then you notice what the um, native vegetation looks like this time of the year. So the green is obviously the irrigated. Um, so in any case, we use spray um, nozzles and sprinkler hoses, um, hoses, nozzles, all of that to spray water onto our crops, but more importantly, onto the soil, because as you know, it's really the roots that are absorbing that water. Most of the time you actually don't want water on your leaves because it can lead to mildew or rot or mold or anything like that. Often we're gonna be using groundwater for this, especially in the US and other developing nations, sorry, developed nations, my bad, other developed nations. But you can also use surface water, it's just um, not as commonly used. There's a couple downsides with this. First off, it's expensive. 
and it does require energy to pump that water. Okay, if you're pumping water, unless you're doing it with um, the power of gravity, you're using electricity to power that pump. Okay, this can be very efficient though. You can have um, like really high tech farms will have uh, monitors in their soil or, uh, or probes in their soil that will detect the soil moisture and turn on the sprinkler system based on a specific soil moisture that you program into the system. So it can get very high tech. It's just more expensive the more high tech you get. This leads to less evaporation or runoff than um, some of our other, the other, the previous two um, sources or uh, methods, but still around a quarter of your water is lost due to evaporation or runoff. Okay, so still relatively inefficient. And our last type of irrigation is drip um, irrigation. You can also incorporate soaker irrigation into this as well. Drip irrigation is where you have a little nozzle or a, just a hole in a, like a tiny hole in the pipe that drips a constant stream or at least a um, steady stream of water right at the base of the plant, right where the roots are. You can set this on a timer so it's not a constant stream, but it's a um, moderated stream based off of your timer, okay? Um, right at the plant's roots, right where they need it. Because you don't have a ton of flowing water and because you don't have um, water really going up into the air or being exposed to the atmosphere for very long periods of time, um, you don't have very much uh, evaporation or runoff. About 5% water is lost. So this is very efficient. This is the most efficient way in terms of water loss. Okay, so in terms of water loss, this is the most efficient method. However, it is very expensive. It takes a lot of money to set up these systems. You need hoses just back and forth, back and forth, snaking through your field. And you need um, tanks and pumps and timers and all of that stuff. It uses a lot of plastic as well. So it's very expensive. And when these hoses go through their functional lifespan, which they eventually will, they might last 10, 15 years, but they will be degraded by the sun and by the elements. Um, then it ends up typically going into the landfill. Okay, they're, they're not really that well, they're, they're not really not that recyclable. Okay. Another benefit of these, though, is that they use little excess fertilizer, and there's little fertilizer runoff. So we'll get to fertilizer later on, and especially fertilizer runoff and the impacts of that. But because we don't have a lot of water just, you know, flowing downhill because it's a very slow, steady stream, um, you don't have that fertilizer running off into your waterways. Because there is very little runoff, there's going to be very little fertilizer runoff. And you can set up your fertilizer um, into the system so that you use just a small targeted amount of fertilizer, the exact amount that your crops need. Okay. Um, this is very common. Actually, sorry, not very common. This is more common in a home setting than it is in an agricultural field. It's more common in the developed world than it is in the developing world. Okay. In the developing world, probably unheard of. Not very, not very common at all but definitely common in your home gardens or your very small scale um, um, farms, uh, especially vegetable farms. Now, while we're on the topic of irrigation, um, I thought we would talk about hydroponics and aquaponics. These are not in the AP standards, but it's worth knowing these. Um, hydroponics, just like the system that I have back in the um, back of the classroom, is growing plants without soil. So this is a soilless medium. Typically, it's clay balls, expanded clay balls, or perlite, or um, rock wool, something like that, that your plants are um, rooted in simply as something for the roots to grab onto and to stabilize the plant, to support the plant, but you get no nutrients from that. All the nutrients comes from aqueous fertilizer water, okay? Aqueous mineral solutions. Most of the time, these are gonna be, as it says, mineral solutions. So they're gonna be in, um, inorganic or synthetic fertilizers, but you can also use organic fertilizers in this as well, um, plant and animal derived fertilizers. Typically, you'll be doing these indoors or in a greenhouse in a controlled setting. The good thing about greenhouses or anything indoors is that it is very controlled. You can easily monitor um, and control for pests. You can control for temperature, humidity. Um, you know, you're not going to be impacted by storms or hail as long as your greenhouse roof doesn't break. Um, 
so it's a it's a controlled environment that your plants can grow in. You can literally grow grow um, tomatoes in the middle of winter in a greenhouse. You can control the amount of light, etc. Okay. Um, some of the pros, it can be very space efficient. Vertical farming is the most space efficient, um, where your um, where your crops are not laid out horizontally as they are in the bottom right, but vertically as in the top right. Um, essentially, what you would have is I can't. Um, it looks like the water would be trickling down like this from a common source at the top. And all of these are rooted into these pipes. Um, you can notice the little notch that they cut out um, for those plants to grow. And this is very space efficient. Rather than growing hundreds of heads of lettuce horizontally and using much more space, you're growing them all vertically and using that upward space, especially if you have the light to do that. Okay, so this is probably... Um, facing south so that it gets that south exposure in the northern hemisphere. Um, like I said, it's easy to regulate these growth variables, everything from light to weeds to pests, all of that. This actually uses less water than traditional agriculture. There's virtually no runoff. There's, I mean, there's very little evaporative loss, especially if it's all confined in pipes rather than in trays. And the water is very often circulated. So we will say that there is a large pump that takes an, an, into a large pipe that takes water to the top of this, um, a line that you can't see, but I'll just draw it there, drifts water down onto the roots of all these plants, all collects in a pipe down at the bottom, which takes it back to your reservoir um, to be recirculated. Now you will often have to flush that whole system and uh, replace those nutrients that have been used before you add new nutrients, but still uses less water than traditional agriculture. Okay, And like I said, you can grow tomatoes in the depths of winter in the northern hemisphere. Um, it extends the growing season and you can grow plants outside of their native ranges. So you can grow um, tomatoes in Iceland when you never would be able to do that outside of a greenhouse. Some of the cons is that this is very expensive. So there is that um, that payback period that you that you need to you know you have to buy all this material up front, and then you have to sell a lot of lettuce to pay for this greenhouse and the hydroponic system itself. Um, it does require electricity. Now it can be renewable sources of electricity or it could be fossil fuels. I'll give you an example of renewable because um, we haven't talked about electricity production yet. In Iceland, a lot of these greenhouses are powered by geothermal energy. So the lights, the pumps, the, um, the heaters, all of that stuff is powered by geothermal and it's 100% renewable rather than in the United States where it might be on um, natural gas po power plants. Okay. That's just as an example, okay? In the United States, it could be solar or wind or anything else, but just as a random example, okay? Um, the physical land footprint is also somewhat significant. Um, obviously, you can grow all of these outside, and if you're doing that outside, it's going to be a more somewhat natural setting, okay? There's going to be some habitat for native um organisms um, like there'll be some you know stuff going on in the soil there will be insects there will be birds there will be some small mammals maybe but if you grow it all in a greenhouse you're literally creating like like you're removing all of that okay um, it's just a more artificial so, um, setting so it just provides no habitat just like a natural or like a, a um, some agriculture systems can okay we'll talk about some that can others that don't uh, let's move on to aquaponics so aquaponics is basically hydroponics except you're raising fish with those um, plants so hydroponics is just using um, just growing plants using fertilizer water this is growing fish typically tilapia because it's a large freshwater fish that lots of people like um, but you can grow other fish as well um, with your plants rather than using fertilizer water you're using the fr the fish waste as fertilizer so the fish you know defecate into the water that um, poop laden fish poop laden water is used to um, feed the plants the plants uh, the plant roots are purifying that water which can be pumped back down to the fish creating a closed system um, that is uh, you know pretty awesome Okay, you have all the same pros and cons, but you're also raising this protein source. Okay, and then besides the fish food, it's pretty it's pretty darn sustainable. 
All right, let's look at one major environmental impact of irrigation, and that is salinization. Salinization typically happens in arid environments because it's a result of um, using groundwater to water your crops, that water evaporates, leaving the salts from that hard water behind. So most groundwater is not gonna be, you know, pure distilled water. It's gonna have, uh, it's gonna be hard water that typically has calcium ions or, you know, magnesium ions or any other type of ion, often calcium. Um, and those salts remain on the soil when the water evaporates. I'll show you guys an example um, in class when we do the salinization lab of some of the house plants that I have in the back of the classroom, um, building up a crust of um, salt on top of, this, on top of the soil because I'm using tap water to water those plants. You really shouldn't, but I do. Okay, it's the water that I have. So this happens in arid environments because that water is evaporating that the plants are also using it. The water's being used, but a lot of it is evaporating, um, leading to the salts building up on the soil, right? You're pumping more and more and more and more water onto the soil. And the, the water's evaporating, but the salts from that, so, uh, from that water are staying behind. That is creating saline soils, which plants cannot grow in. Okay, so your yield is gonna decrease and you may have to eventually abandon this field. Now, how to remediate this? There's a couple ways to remediate it. One is deep plowing. Um, so you can bury this salt deeper into the soil and kind of uh, spread the salt out through the soil column rather than just having it in the surface where your seedlings are germinating. The other method to do this is, or to remediate it is to just flood this field. And if the field is on a slope, especially, a lot of those salts will um, will dissolve into it and then be carried off with the runoff. So you can flood that field and carry those salts away, or you flood the field and the salts can leach into the soil column. But in many cases, it's very difficult to remediate this just because of the local, um, local conditions. We'll talk about a lot more when we talk about our lab and class, but it's a major problem that's affecting um, agricultural fields everywhere especially in arid regions and you know people are moving or people are growing lots of crops in arid regions around the world using lots of groundwater so it's a major concern another environmental impact of um of using irrigation is the water that we use and if we use it at a rate that is not sustainable then we can deplete those water resources okay i have a couple maps showing that um in fact, I have two on this page and one, another one on the next page, um, kind of before and after in each case. So on this one on the left, we're looking at Tulare Lake in South Central California. This was the largest freshwater lake um, west of the Mississippi River in the United States. Okay, so you can see where in California it is, um, Central Valley, and what its extent was before agriculture moved into the region and depleted that water source. The lake is virtually non-existent anymore. Okay, it went from being the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi to be ba basically gone um, today. Okay, that is twofold. That is because people drew water directly from the lake for agriculture, but it's also because they drew water from all the tributaries of the lake for agriculture. Basically, the same thing happened um, in the Aral Sea, which is a very large freshwater lake um, on the border of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and what was um, Soviet, um, the USSR. And during the, the during the Soviet um, occupation, during the time that the Soviets controlled this, um, they decided that cotton would that this area would be great to grow cotton. Cotton is one of our thirstiest crops. Cotton needs tons and tons of water to grow, um, and all the irrigation from that into this very arid landscape came from this lake and the tributaries of this lake. And you see the before and after pictures of this as well. And they're still um, doing cotton production there because they don't have anything else to do, right? It's, it's their main economy. And then finally, a third example is the Ogallala Aquifer in the, um, in the United States, the central United States, the Great Plains. Um, this is one of the largest aquifers in the world and about 27 percent of u.s irrigated land is fed by this aquifer alone okay think about eastern colorado western kansas um, north texas it's pretty arid right new mexico pretty arid so we're using lots of um, 
lots of water from this aquifer to feed those, um, or not feed, but to water those crops. Okay. Um, now, think back to that slide that I had about um, spray irrigation and the arid brown dusty fields um, that have that are spotted or dotted with those circular areas of green. That's what we're looking at here. Now we do have areas, especially in Nebraska, where the aquifer is recovering, Texas as well, but we have many areas where the aquifer is um, being depleted. Okay, and that's just what we have data for. Okay, um, so about 30% of the aquifer wells have run dry. So that's this area of this uh, darker brownish red. Um, and it's projected that about 70% of the aquifer will be depleted by 2070 if we continue with the unsustainable rates that we're using it. However, we can use aquifers sustainably. Aquifers can be recharged. Now this varies greatly based off of the type of aquifer, it's um, whether it's confined, like is right here, or if it's unconfined. Um, unconfined aquifers will, um, will recharge in the matter of days to years, whereas a confined aquifer, meaning that it is separated from the, um, separated from the surface by, a, um, by an impermeable soil or rock layer, such as a um, compacted clay, they will recharge over the period of centuries to millennia. So it really just depends on whether that aquifer is confined or unconfined, the types of rocks around it, the type of vegetation above it, the amount of, um, the amount of uh, precipitation received in the area. But in general, aquifers can be recharged. The way that they're recharged is by water percolating into the soil, especially if that soil is very porous or if there's porous rock near the surface, and that's going to be able to, um, to quickly recharge an unconfined aquifer given significant amount of precipitation. But again, we're looking at centuries to millennia for confined aquifers. So aquifers need to be used very wisely. They need to be used at a sustainable rate so that those resources are there for future generations. Okay, um, we can artificially um, charge aquifers as well. I'm hoping that we're gonna have time to watch a video about that in class. So the video that I'm thinking of is one in India where they are intentionally creating these um, these like ridges on the landscape, these, these, um, these artificial kind of dams to catch rainwater during the monsoon season and allow it to sit there during um, throughout the year and slowly absorb down into the soil to recharge the aquifers that they're using for their, um, for their food production, for their irrigation. Okay, really cool video. I just hope that we have time to watch it. I actually have it linked in this PowerPoint if you check out the PDF version that's on Schoology. All right, let's look at some more environmental impacts of the Green Revolution. The first one is mechanization. Um, mechanization means that we're using machinery to um, plow our fields, harvest our crops, etc. Okay, so tilling and plowing is going to increase erosion. That all that dust that you see right here is this farmer losing some topsoil due to um, plowing while it's dry and that topsoil blowing away in the wind. Okay, doesn't look like it's a strong wind because it's not super dusty, but still, you're losing some soil. Um, we have an increased reliance on fossil fuels. Most farms in the United States are heavily reliant on diesel fuel. Um, it's one of our bigger use, or one of our larger uses of diesel around um, the country. We can compact soils. This is a lot of mass that is spread over a relatively small area, right? Four tires, um, and it's potentially compacting those soils. Okay. Now you are plowing behind it, so that is. Um, that's loosening the soil, that's tilling the soil, that's uh, turning the soil. So it's not compacting too terribly much in this scenario, but when you're harvesting, you're compacting that soil between the harvest time and the next plowing time, which could lead to increased erosion, um, or it could, if you're planting a cover crop, impede the roots that are growing. Okay, and then we have the agricultural job loss as well, um, because we're replacing human labor with machine labor. Now there's both positive and negative effects of that. The positive effects are that we have uh, more people in the cities, more people in tech jobs, more people um, in the service industry, etc. The negative effects is that um, people do rely on these agricultural jobs, so you may lose, um, they may lose their income, their their um, 
and their source of income. Monocultures. Monocultures are a huge negative effect. This is a large field of only one crop, okay? A, a field that is just corn, a field that is just wheat, a field that is just soy. If we plant monocultures year after year after year, those um, every crop uses certain nutrients, okay? And they use more, they're going to use lots, a variety of nutrients, but they're going to use some nutrients more than others, okay? Something might be very nitrogen um, demanding or something might be very phosphorus demanding. And as you grow that one crop year after year after year, you deplete that one nutrient that it really needs um, over time. So you have to be, so you become more reliant on chemical fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers. Most of those are, um, water soluble so they end up running into your waterways during a rain or something um, during a flooding event or whatever um, and you end up monetarily um, in terms of your income being confined to just one crop as well so if that one so, so you're really dependent on um, the the market prices of corn year to year, or you know, without without government subsidies, you're you're reliant on the on on the um, you know speculative stock market prices. I don't really understand all that economic stuff, but you're you're reliant on all of that, which can lead to bad years. Okay, rather than if you're growing lots of different crops, then maybe one of them will supplement your income a little bit more. Okay. But really, it's the soil depletion that is um, really an impact um, for our class, and that leads to the increased use of chemical fertilizers, which we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about. Now, those chemical fertilizers, they can be toxic to consumers, primary, secondary, tertiary consumers, and the so um, soil or water. Again, they are going to run off very easily because many of them are water soluble. Um, but you can also lead to eutrophication if they get into a natural body of water. And then we just have more of these nutrients in the biosphere because they are being, they are synthetic and they're either being mined or extracted um, from the atmosphere. We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So sticking with fertilizers, all plants need nutrients to grow. Some are more nutrient demanding than others. And if you're gonna grow vegetables or grains or fruits or anything, you're gonna need very nutrient rich soil for the most part. Um, because that's gonna give you a higher yield, okay? Typically, the more nutrients that you have, the higher yield you're gonna have up to a point in which case, um, after, after which point it's not really gonna matter at all and you're just wasting your money, okay? Um, fertilize, or sorry, nutrients can be put into two broad categories. Those are macronutrients, what the plant needs in large amounts. That's your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. NPK, you will often see NPK written on fertilizer labels, and then you'll have percentages, maybe 20, 10, not even percentages, but um, just numbers which reflect percentages below it. Okay, so those will be on fertilizer labels. You, you'll see that at Home Depot or Nix or Tagawa or whatever you're shopping for plant stuff. Um, and you also have micronutrients. Micronutrients are what plants need in very really small amounts but they do need them and your nutrients should supply those. If they're not, then your soil can be depleted of micronutrients just as easily as macronutrients. More rare, but still happens. Okay, fertilizers provide nutrients. Okay, so yeah, fertilizers provide nutrients. We'll talk about what I was gonna thinking of a little bit later. Um, there's two broad categories of fertilizer. There is synthetic and there is organic. Synthetic fertilizers are created from factories from inorganic sources. And when I say created in factories, they can also be mined and then those materials shipped to factories to be refined, um, et cetera, okay? But they're, they're created from inorganic sources, meaning sources that aren't, weren't living, okay? The pros is that they're very cheap. They become very cheap in our industrialized society. They're pretty effective. They're easily easy to calculate the use for because you know exactly how much nutrients are in that and you can use targeted amounts and you can have you have tons of different mixtures. You can like you as a home gardener or just as a normal person can go to a gardening center and get some specifically for pine trees or for tomatoes or for whatever crop you want pretty much. The cons though. The cons is that they're potentially toxic pollutant. Again, they can be toxic to your soil organisms. 
and as well as to um, aquatic organisms, that being toxic to soil organisms is huge because much of the health of your soils is down to the microorganisms and the macroorganisms in your soil. Everything from earthworms to fungi um, to bacteria in your soil help your plants grow. Fungi especially have symbiotic relationships with, or some fungi have symbiotic relationships with plants where the, fung where the fungus will literally be in contact with the plant roots and sometimes inside the plant roots. And the fungus will supply um, uh, minerals and um, minerals and nutrients from the soil to the plant, and the plant will give the fungus carbohydrates. If you add these chemical fertilizers to your soil, you are potentially killing those fun those fungi that are helping your plants grow. Okay, so you can actually have by supplying nutrients, you can actually have decreased yield because you're killing all the beneficial organisms in the soil. Again, everything from earthworms, which are so important to fungi to bacteria. Um, many of these fertilizers, like I said, are water soluble, so they run off into your waterways, which creates eutrophication. And you create industrial byproducts that often have to be disposed of. Um, some of those are pretty nasty, especially for um, pesticides, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but even for fertilizers, they can be pretty nasty. We can contrast synthetic um, pesticide, or sorry, fertilizers with organic. I'm getting ahead of myself now thinking about pesticides. Um, fertilizers, organic fertilizers. These are plant or animal remains. Organic in this sense means that they contain carbon. Okay, so they are from living organisms. Okay, they're plant or animal remains. That can include manure or guano, feces, it can actually include urine as well, so uh, your, like um, natural urea sources, um, urine. It can include slaughterhouse waste, so um, you know it's better to use the waste from a slaughterhouse for growing plants than it is to just throw it in a landfill. So you can be looking at bone meal, so ground up bone that's powdered form, that's very high in phosphorus and potassium and calcium. Um, it could be blood meal, which is very high in nitrogen, feather meal, also high in nitrogen. Green manure. Green manure is essentially you grow a cover crop that you then till into the soil. Okay, so you grow a cover crop. So let's say that you have a field of wheat. You grow your wheat. Um, actually, let's, let's say that you have winter rye. Let's do that. So let's say that you grow your winter rye over the fall to winter to spring months. You harvest it and then you're not going to grow any more winter rye um, until the next year. Well, what you can do, because winter rye is relatively nitrogen, um, nitrogen demanding, is plant a legume in that, um, on that field, probably clover, on that field, and um, allow it to grow, allow it to um, fix nitrogen using the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria in its root nodules and allow it to build up a lot of nitrogen in its vegetative plant body. Before it flowers, you would then um, till that crop back into the soil or into the soil, allow it to decompose and all that nitrogen is returned to the soil. So that's, a, that's what green manure is. Compost is what you see on the top right. It is essentially um, mostly plant but often animal remains as well that are piled up and allowed to decompose um, in a concentrated and um, um, large setting sorry i'm blanking on the word but a more concentrated concentrated setting that you can then put onto your crops um, compost is often called black gold by gardeners because it typically is an even darker color than this and you should know that Anything, any soil that is very dark is very nutrient rich because it has lots of um, organic matter in it and that is very high in humus. Okay, um, For this class, you can often think of compost and humus as somewhat similar but not quite synonyms. Okay, um, That organic matter, not only is it full of your macronutrients, but also contains lots of carbon. It's also very high in carbon. That carbon is going to feed 
these soil organisms that I talked about, the earthworms, the fungi, um, and the bacteria that are in the soil. And they're going to do even better. They're going to proliferate and they're going to feed your plants even more. Let's just think about earthworms for a second. Earthworms um, create something called worm castings. That should be two words. There should be a space there. Um, worm castings or worm poop. And they're probably the best form of um, fertilizer that you can buy. It's like worm poop is the best. It's, it's, um, there's, something weird with the worm's digestive system and where it actually excretes more bacteria in the beneficial bacteria in its castings than it has coming into um, into its mouth. Like there's more higher bacterial concentrations of beneficial bacteria coming out than there is going in. It's great stuff. So you spread leaves on your garden in the fall and over the winter, spring, summer even, um, the worms will eat all those leaves and turn those leaves into castings, okay? So any of those um, are examples of organic fertilizers. The pros of organic fertilizers is that um, they are naturally occurring compounds. They feed those beneficial um, organisms in soil, not just microbes, but macro um, organisms, as well as the plants. And again, many of them have symbiotic relationships with your plants, so they're helping your plants as well. They recycle the nutrients from the biosphere. Okay, so putting rather than putting all of your vegetable peelings and yard waste into the landfill, you can put them into the compost bin, okay, um, and keep them in circulation. All right, um, and they can be made on site. So it reduces fossil fuel use and shipping. Some of the cons is that they're expensive, um, potentially expensive if you're buying them from a garden center. Um, they're potentially free if you're making them at home. They can be very heavy. So they're typically solids. They're not aqueous solutions and they're not concentrated aqueous solutions. So they can be heavy. So that means that it's more labor intensive to spread them on a the field. It means that it requires more fossil fuel use to move them from the store to your home. Okay. Um, it can still cause runoff if overused, especially um, animal manure. Um, you can have unknown or varying nutrient levels. And if you use fresh manure, that can have fecal coliform bacteria. And this is the main way that fecal coliform bacteria like E. coli gets on your crops. So if you have like a spinach outbreak with um, E. coli on it, it's probably because they sprayed it with fresh manure, okay, which is kind of gross, but that's how it happens. All right. Um, real quick about um, the nit um, about nitrogen fertilizers. We talked about this when we talked about the nitrogen cycle, but I have a little bit more detail here. Um, the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber-Bosch process is a way to synthetically create ammonium um, NH4 plus from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. Okay, that hydrogen gas is typically coming from methane. All right, um, but you get ammonium at the end. This is a major concern because it's increasing the amount of nitrogen in the biosphere. The amount of nitrogen um, fertilizer, the amount of ammonium and nitrates in the biosphere. Okay, we don't necessarily know all of the repercussions of this, but the major repercussion that we do know is eutrophication and widespread eutrophication, including dead zones in the ocean, which we'll talk about later on in our pollutions unit. Okay, and then basically same thing for phosphorus because we're taking lots of phosphates out of mines and increasing the amount that is in the, um, the, the biosphere and the living circulation of the planet. So now, now that we've talked about fertilizers, let's talk about pesticides. Um, so it's often necessary to use pesticides. There's a lot of critters out there that want to eat our crops, okay? Everything from uh, fungi to insects want to consume our crops in one way or another, okay? And if you are relying on those crops to feed your family, you don't want your family to starve. So you're gonna spray a pesticide. Or if you're relying on those crops to um, get money to feed your family, you know, you're gonna spray a pesticide. It's often financially worth it. Now. Before we get any further, let me clear this all up. First off, a pesticide you will often use as an umbrella term to encompass all of these things here, okay? A pesticide is going to include what we traditionally in the narrow sense think of as pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, uh, fungicides, etc. And 
it should be pretty clear what each of these are. Pesticides means pests. We're going to say that is insects and related organism. Herbicides is killing plants, so that is weed killer. A fungicide is killing fungi. And a rodenticide is killing rodents, rat poison, essentially. Okay. Pesticide in the broad sense, though, can encompass all of those. It can be used as an umbrella term. Okay, so you'll often see that um, kind of interchangeably, and it's a little confusing. Okay, we'll talk about um, the evolution of resistance on a later slide. I have a whole slide on the pesticide treadmill, but we'll talk about that on a later slide. Just like fertilizers, we have two broad categories, um, synthetic and organic. Um, synthetic pesticides, also called chemical pesticides, are produced in the lab. They're from, um, they're from you know, chemical processes that are produced in the lab, but most of them are modeled off of natural chemicals. Okay, so they take a natural chemical, some fungus makes a natural chemical that um, repels insects or something, and they tweak it in the lab so that they can mass produce it. Others are um, very indiscriminate pesticides that are essentially bioweapons. Um, some of them are literally poison gases that we used in World War One, or even just made from poison gases that we used in World War One. So there's a really wide range of that. Some of the benefits of the, um, of that is that they're of synthetic pesticides is that they're cheap and typically often effective, but they can harm crops, they can harm the environment, they can harm your soil organisms, they can harm the organisms in water. There's a lot of negative impacts that we'll talk about in the following slides. And many of them are refined from crude oil as well. So it's one of the many uses that we use oil for. Organic pesticides, um, just like it sounds, are derived from living things. So neem oil, for example, you take the um, seeds of the neem tree, I believe it's the seeds of the neem tree, you press those seeds to extract the oil from it, and um, you use that oil to repel pests. Capsaicin can be used. You might know that capsaicin is what we find in chili peppers. So one of the pesticides that I use in my home garden is I'll take a drop of dish soap and um, a bunch of chili peppers, grind up the chilies, boil them in water, extract a lot of the capsaicin, and that dish soap helps with that, and um, spray it on my crops. Kills the insects, or at least repels them. We will also include biocontrols or biological controls in our organic um, pest control methods. Okay, these are not chemicals, but it's using living organisms that act as pesticides. Okay, um, ladybugs, for example, eat aphids. Uh, um, praying mantis eat grasshoppers, etc. Okay, um, any type of organism, living organism. We'll maybe talk about a couple more in class. There's a couple cool videos about parasitic wasps um, in class. Um, these are typically, organic pesticides in general are typically expensive, they're typically less effective, um, but they are neutral to your crops and sometimes the environment, okay? Ladybugs aren't going to have any impact on your crops. Neem oil isn't going to have any impact on your crops unless you spray a little bit too much and it covers the leaves too much. Um, so they're often less effective, but they're often a lot more environmentally friendly. Finally, I have one more bullet point here about genetically modified organisms. Um, crops can be bred to be um, to increase the resistance to pests, but there's a lot of GM crops coming out that um, are that have uh, um, genes in them from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis that um, creates a protein that is a toxin to insects. Okay, so this. Um, this protein that these plants are now making because they have this gene from this bacteria is being used to control a wide variety of insects that munch on these plants. Okay, there's a pretty cool article about it right here. All right, so some modern environmental impacts of pesticides. Um, first off, we have an increased use of them around the planet um, as people move um, into more um, modern agricultural methods. Okay. Many of these pesticides are what we call non-discriminant. They're wide-acting toxins that affect pretty much any organism that they come in contact with, especially animals that they come in contact with. Okay, A pesticide um, that is targeted for insects often is poisonous to humans. Not always, 
but many times it is. Okay, you would not go to Home Depot and drink a bottle of pesticide. You would die. Okay, um, it's estimated that between 95 to 98 percent of pesticides and herbicides don't reach the target species. Okay, so you're spraying a field for aphids, and that pesticide that you're using is a non-discriminant um, pesticide, and it's not only killing the aphids in your field, but it's also killing the ladybugs that happen to be there that are eating your aphids. It's killing the earthworms in the soil. It's killing the spiders that are um, also beneficial. It's running off into the water and killing the fish, etc. And since we're using about 5 billion pounds of pesticides and herbicides around the, around the world every year, that's a lot of organisms that we're killing every year because we're trying to kill a select few organisms that are eating our crops. This is causing um, insect populations around the world to plummet. And we're not just talking about the insect populations or the populations of insects that are eating your crops, but we're also talking about your pollinators and your beneficial insects. Okay. Many of these pesticides run off into waterways because, again, many of them can be water soluble and they can end up um, polluting your waters. Okay. They can also um, affect the organisms in the soil. They can affect um, organisms, um, beneficial organisms um, in the water, the soil, etc. They can also affect uh, um, your crops as well. So if you're spraying a um, a non-discriminant herbicide on one field, but it's getting run off into um, a canal that's that's feeding another field, you can um, negatively impact that. And then finally, they can drift. You might add this to your vocab, but it means that they can blow away in the wind. So if you have a um, plane spraying pesticide um, near a small town or a small community, it can drift over to those people in that community um, and they can breathe it in. Even in very small amounts with repeated exposure, it can have very um, very severe and long-lasting negative health effects. Okay. Um, one example that we have of non-target species is rice paddies. Um, traditionally, rice paddies in Asia, especially Southeast Asia, um, used to support much more than just rice. You would grow leafy greens, some of those being weedy leafy greens in that rice paddy so that you can use them in soups, salads, etc. You would have several species of fish in that um, rice paddy, crustaceans like crawdads in that rice paddy, mollusks like snails, and waterfowl like ducks all in those rice paddies. And you can use those um, whether from uh, fishing, collection, or hunting. Um, to have a very wide variety diet. You introduce pesticides to that, the crustaceans, the fish, the uh, mollusks, and even the waterfowl die. And you lose all those protein sources and that can lead to malnutrition and has even been implicated in malnutrition in one study from um, the Philippines and Vietnam that I read. I can share that with you guys if you want. Okay. Um, so we go from this very ecologically diverse um, agricultural field to something that is only supporting just rice and just rice alone is not a full complement of all the nutrients that a human body needs. Okay. Um, pesticides also have human health effects, especially cancers. We'll talk about some of these um, later on, but many pesticides are based off of chemical weapons. Um, some of them literally are chemical weapons that we have just slapped a brand name on um, and they were used in World War I and they're still being used um, today. Okay, They're non-discriminant um, chemicals that are designed to kill and many of them do it very effectively. However, as someone once said, nature does find a way and even if they're very effective at killing, there's going to be a few individuals that survive. Those few individuals that survive may have a random genetic mutation that makes them slightly resistant or moderately resistant to a pesticide. And those individuals are the ones left that breed. And you eventually have um, get a population that is pesticide resistant. So you have to spray more pesticide and then they develop more resistance. And then you have to spray more pesticide and then they develop more resistance. And then you have to switch to another pesticide and they develop some resistance to that. And then you have to apply more of that and they become resistant. You guys see where I'm going. This is something called the pesticide treadmill. Essentially what we're looking at is kind of like more, more like a Stairmaster um, thing than a treadmill or a escalator. 
where you have increased use of pesticides to treat or to kill the same amount of insects over time. Okay, that's what we're seeing on the graph on the bottom right. This creates a positive feedback loop. Okay, the more pesticides that you add, the more resistant they become, the more pesticides you have to add, the more resistant they become. Okay, huge problem uh, worldwide. And it's the reason, um, one of the main reasons that um, pesticide use has been skyrocketing worldwide. And I just want to show, share this story with you because I think it's kind of tragically funny. It's It's super sad, but it's hilarious at the same time. Um, in China, um, during the Great Leap Forward, um, you know, during communist reign of Chairman Mao, um, he ordered the elimination of the four great pest species. Um, those are rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. Now, we can all probably get behind getting rid of rats, flies, and mosquitoes, okay? They definitely perform functions in the environment and they are um, they each have their niche and everything but um you know we'd probably most of us get behind eliminating those but sparrows come on why sparrows sparrows were blamed on eating too much grain so you have your rice paddy you have your wheat field whatever and the sparrows were blamed on eating too much of those grains they were essentially used as a scapegoat for the government's failed agricultural practices. We don't have to get into those agricultural practices today, um, but there was a lot of um, novel but somewhat misinformed agricultural practices combined with some bad years in terms of weather that led to massive famine. However, sparrows mainly eat insects. They, don't, they do like to eat grains. They'll definitely eat grains, but they prefer to eat insects. They're one of the best insect controls that you can have in your um, field. So the element, you eliminate sparrows, you have propaganda campaigns like the one um, up here that says everyone come and fight sparrows. Um, and you would have kids that, have, that, that are tasked with going outside at recess from school to just kill sparrows with slingshots, okay? Um, they were very effective at limiting their sparrow population, but that led to massive insect outbreaks, which led to famine because they're, the insects are eating their crops, which led to the introduction of synthetic pesticides, which led to the pesticide treadmill, which led to the elimination of, or rather that leads to the pesticide treadmill and then also leads to the elimination of your beneficial insects. So the introduction of synthetic pesticides also leads to the elimination of your beneficial insects, especially or including the bees. So you might have heard that in some parts of China today, um, fruit crops have to be hand pollinated. So you have to literally take a little duster, often a little feather duster or something similar texture, and take the pollen off of male flowers or the male parts of one flower and brush them onto the female parts of another flower um, as a bee would. And there are some areas of China where there is so much pesticides being used or that have historically been used that bee populations are virtually eliminated and people have to manually um, manually um, pollinate their fruit crops. So one of the major negative um, impacts of um, synthetic pesticides, think about the labor that it takes to do that. And if you want to read the article, I've linked it here, but I'll link it in the description below. And it is really important to know that bees and other pollinating insects, so I'll just say pollinating insects, pollinate up to, or between a third, or sorry, two thirds, and 87% of all of our food. Okay. Um, very, very ecologically important. That's one of the main ecological services um, or sorry, um, ecosystem services that they're performing. Okay, so pollinating insects are crucial. If we didn't have these pollinating insects, we could hand pollinate everything. But aside from that, um, we would lose basically everything besides, like all fruits and veggies besides grains. Grains are wind pollinated. They don't rely on insects. So we would be eating um, a diet of uh, wheat and corn, primarily, and then you can throw potatoes in there and garlic because you can asexually propagate them. But anyway, um, pollinating insects are crucial. Everything from bees to butterflies, etc., even flies.
So let's talk about IPM. IPM is, stands for Integrated Pest Management. This is both a philosophy and a methodology or a practice to effectively control insect populations while minimizing environmental impacts. Note that I use the term control and not eliminate because you can often use, or sorry, you can often have a, um, an amount of crops that are lost due to insects and it doesn't really affect the bottom line too terribly much. So controlling them rather than eliminate them. It involves a series of steps and you guys should become familiar with this series of steps. You will first inspect and sample for pests. You will do this continually throughout the growing season. If you find pests, you will properly identify them. Proper identification means that you can target your, um, your practices and know the species biology. Okay, so you, you're using um, methods that are specific for that species. Okay, you should, so you should learn the pest biology after you identify the pest. You should determine an action threshold. That essentially means what is the minimum, or sorry, the maximum amount of loss of your crop that you can tolerate. And that's going to vary based on the person. Okay, if if you're a farmer growing kale for market, you're not going to want any holes, or you're going to want just a few minor holes in your kale uh, in your kale leaves. However, me at home, and I'm only growing kale for myself, I can tolerate a lot more holes in my leaves from grasshoppers or whatever because I don't really mind that much. As long as I wash it, it's fine. Okay, so determine an action threshold. That's going to vary depending on um, on the person. And then you're going to choose a tactic. You know, you're going to do this in step also. Your first tactic is going to be cultural management. That essentially means that you're changing anything about your practices that will lead to pests being there. If your pests are mice, maybe you remove your chicken grain off of the floor and store it in a mice-proof container, or if your um, if your pest is slugs, maybe you remove mulch and um, wooden boards that slugs like to hide in during the heat of the day from your garden. Okay. Physical management is step two. That would be f physical prevention or removal. So that is like literally getting on your hands and knees and weeding your fields, or using a hoe, which is a gardening tool, to weed your to to weed your fields. Okay, or it could be physically removing um, grasshoppers from your plants, which I practice in my garden. I will f get out there early in the morning around dawn and when the grasshoppers are, are really slow and physically remove them from my plants. Or you would be removing caterpillars from the leaves by hand, something like that. Biological control would be the use of par predators or paras uh, parasites, etc., on your crops. So a pathogen, an example of that is um, the same BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, you can buy it in a concentrated form. It's just a bacteria that um, is really targeted for um, caterpillars and some other insects as well, but mainly caterpillars. You spray it on any plants that are being affected by caterpillars, but it won't kill your ladybugs. It'll just kill the caterpillars. Okay, gets in their digestive system and kills them. Um, you could be using ladybugs like we talked about. That would be a predator. You can use parasitic wasps, which are really cool. They're literally like wasps that lay their eggs inside of aphids or caterpillars or something, and they the larvae eat the host from the inside out. Super cool. Um, one of the potential negatives of biological control is that those biological controls can escape and target native organisms. So you do have to be um, aware of that when you're using them and you have to do a little bit of research. One of the biggest um, failed examples of this is the cane toad that was introduced into um, Australia and elsewhere, but mainly Australia for being an invasive species to um, kill a beetle, I believe, off of uh, sugarcane, but it failed miserably and the cane toad is now an invasive species in Australia. If biological control doesn't work, then you move to chemical, chemical management. You will use organic chemicals first and then synthetic chemicals as a last resort. Um, sometimes you won't even get to that. If you are an organic farm, you will never use synthetic chemicals because that would remove your organic licensure. Okay. Um, 
even like I used to work at the Denver Aquarium, you would never even use organic pesticides um, because they could get into the fish tanks below them um, and kill the fish. Okay, so we would just be limited to these three at the Denver Aquarium. We couldn't do any chemical management whatsoever. Okay, on the plants, I, I grew plants there. I was the horticulturist. And then finally you would evaluate and you would go back to step one. So it is a cycle. All right, so you guys should be familiar with those steps. And by evaluate, I mean, did it work? Did it not work? What would I change? How could I improve, et cetera? Some pros and cons of IPM. Um, it can be environmentally friendly and sustainable. However, it is very labor intensive. It's relatively complex. Um, it's relatively time consuming and it can be expensive, right? If you're hand weeding fields, not only is that um, labor intensive, time consuming, but you have to pay for that labor as well if you're um, not doing it in your own, like if, if you're not doing it in your own fields as the farmer, you're hiring hands to do it. Okay, um, but it also does reduce the amount of synthetic pesticides, which can definitely have human health impacts and environmental impacts. So every year there is confusion about um, pesticides versus fertilizer. Please do not confuse these. I don't know why there's confusion, but it's probably because we're so removed from the agricultural system. Fertilizers um, are what are, provide the nutrients for plants to grow. I should really just change that to nutrients rather than minerals provide the nutrients for plants to grow, whereas pesticides kill things, okay? Side means kill. So if you ever see side, um, know that it means to kill, right? Homicide is murder, it's killing humans, homo, human. Um, fertilizers, plant food, okay? Think P, or sorry, F for food, um, plant food, whereas a pesticide is side and it is a chemical to kill. Okay, in this case, kill pests, but again, pesticide can be an umbrella term that encompasses all of those. So please don't confuse those. All right, let's look at some more negative impacts of the Green Revolution. The first, or uh, uh, not the first, but um, another of the many that we've talked about is habitat loss. We've talked about this extensively, so I'm not going to um, really harp on this too much, except for where it has to do with um, meat production, because that's what we're talking about next. Okay. Um, if you recall the 10% rule, about 90% of the energy is lost from one trophic level to the other. Only about 10% remains. So if your trophic level um, goes from, or sorry, if, if, your, um, if your food chain goes from plant to human, you get 10% of the energy from that plant, okay, or from those plants. Okay, so let's say that there's just 10,000 kilocalories in a field and the people in that system can get a thousand kilocals, all right? But let's say instead of that, we're going plant to cow to human. You lose an additional 90% up that second um, trophic level, and you only have about a hundred kilocals available for the humans. That's a very significant decrease, and that leads to a lot more land being needed to feed the cows, to feed the people, rather than if we were just, you know, and I could say pork or chicken, um, sorry, pigs or chicken or cow, uh, sheep or goats or any other um, animal that we eat. But it takes a lot more land to feed livestock than it does um, for human consumption than it would to just grow plants for human consumption. Okay, so it's much less efficient than eating lower on the food chain. Okay, and that's the phrase that I want you guys to use rather than um, being vegetarian or being vegan, just say eating lower on the food chain. Okay, so in terms of habitat loss, um, one of the starkest examples is in the American Midwest. Let's just use Iowa as an example. It used to be a very diverse tall grass prairie where you had about 12 um, grass species plus many different um, flowering plants, uh, broadly flowering plants, okay, both monocots and dicots. Uh, don't worry that I said that you don't need to know those terms. Today, only about 2% of that tall grass prairie remains, and it remains typically in isolated patches in um, around uh, train tracks and cemeteries are the two big areas, okay? Because that's where people allow grass to grow. Um, most of the land in Iowa is used for corn and soy farming, not all of it, but that's just a lot of it. Um, and much of that corn and soy is used to feed cattle, pigs, and poultry. 
Some of it is sent to the processing plants to make uh, the edible food-like substances like Doritos that we like to snack on, but some, uh, much of it is used to feed livestock. So we'll look at these in class. In fact, I meant to delete that possible part, um, but if you want to check it out, please do. But we'll definitely look at this one in class, um, just for our, um, yeah, in class. But if you're at home, I'll link it in the description below. So the mean global meat consumption has almost doubled since the beginning of the Green Revolution. Again, we're still talking about the Green Revolution here. It went from about 23 kilograms per person per year in 1961 to about 43 kilograms per person per year in 2014. If you read old books from the early 1900s, the 1800s, the 1700s, you'll and, and they talk about food and meals, you'll often see that meat is rare in meals and it's used for you know special occasions okay um you know holidays weddings birthdays stuff like that today we many people um eat meat literally every single day and many of them for every single meal so the meat um, consumption around the planet has skyrocketed especially in the developed world and again there is land use impacts on that so let's talk about meat production. Um, meat production is super varied, okay? But we're just gonna talk about two extremes of the spectrum. Um, we're gonna compare and contrast free range with CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations. And there's obviously gonna be tons of variety that exists in between those. And even though that I'm going to typically talk about meat production um, and meat as ecologically damaging, Please note that um, I myself am not vegetarian. I do eat meat occasionally. I do own my own um, poultry and that poultry, I have to buy grain for them. I don't raise all the plants that I have to feed to my chickens. So I'm part of this system as well. Meat also has huge cultural significance for many um, cultures um, around the planet, right? Um, food is a huge part of culture and meat is a pretty big part of food. Um, or the absence of meat is a big part of um, our cultural representation of food. So when I talk about meat consumption, a lot of this is personal choice, but we have to be aware of the environmental impacts that are associated with it. So let's talk about free range first. Um, free range means that animals can move freely, so you notice that, um, outdoors for at least part of the day. Many of the time, much of the time, they'll be confined at night just to protect them, right? These chickens are gonna be locked in that coop at night so that foxes do not kill them, okay? What it does not mean though is that they're enclosed 24 seven or confined 24 seven. They're just gonna be confined for part of the day or if weather conditions are really bad. Often it includes fencing. So a lot of people, when they hear free range, will just assume that no fencing is involved, but it does include fencing much of the time because you have to delineate your land from your neighbors, or you have to delineate these organisms or these animals into a certain field, a patch of land for them to graze. And you don't want them getting into your garden so that you, know, you have to fence them. It often includes shelters as well. So you're talking about barns, coops, these little mobile pig shelters for these pigs, et cetera. These animals are able to graze outdoors um, throughout much of their life cycle. Okay, so they're eating a more or less natural diet or they're eating your crop residues like these pigs are doing um, in a more or less natural setting. You can often supplement or ev um, you can often supplement their feed with uh, store-bought or you know factory uh, or uh, industrial uh, setting corn or soy or wheat or whatever uh, grains. Um, okay. The organic waste is typically naturally dispersed into the field and naturally incorporates into the soil and is used to fertilize that field. Okay, so a couple of the benefits that these pigs are providing this field is they're rooting around in the soil, they're turning the soil for you to plant um, crops the following spring because this looks like autumn. And their waste, their fecal matter and their urine is going directly in the soil and will help fertilize that field. And it's not super concentrated because there's not a lot of pigs in that field. Same thing with these cattle, same thing with these chickens. Okay, except they're not turning the soil. The chickens are turning the soil a little bit, but in terms of their waste going right into the field, um, fertilizing it right there where you need it and the amount that you need it. You typically use little antibiotics. Those antibiotics um, are only typically used to treat the sick. Okay, they're not used as a preventative measure. And you typically will use far less disinfectants compared to CAFOs.
okay? Um, because they're outdoors and they're not confined in a small space. And some of the cons though, is that you have to have a, you have to have a lot of, sorry, you have to have a fair amount of land to do this, okay? So you're either growing fewer animals or sorry, raising fewer animals in a certain amount of land, or you need more land to raise the same amount of animals that you would in a CAFO, okay? Either way, you just have a lower population density, okay? So that's one of the cons. You have to have a lot of um, fair amount of land for this. And that's more makes it more expensive and that cost is therefore transferred to the consumer. So you'll often see that free range blank meat is um, much more expensive at the grocery store than anything that's not labeled free range. Many types exist. We're not going to go into all the details of the different types of free range or the pseudo types of free range, but just as a broad overview, that's what free range is. We can contrast that with CAFOs, and I've spared you some of the more heart-wrenching um, photos of CAFOs. CAFOs are pretty awful living conditions for animals. Okay, um, A CAFO, also known as a feedlot, but I prefer for you to use the term CAFO in this class. Um, you will oft, oft, often see this in the um, in the popular press as a factory farm, but you should use the term CAFO. This is a type of intensive animal feeding operation where the animals are confined at least 45 days out of the year. Some of those will get away with um, being called a CAFO by only confining animals for 44 or 40 days a year, in which case it's just an intensive animal feeding operation, an AFO. Okay. Again, several types exist. Animals will often live their entire lives in these CAFOs. These turkeys are gonna live their entire life in this room, okay? Or they can be finished there. These cattle are probably just finished in a CAFO, meaning that they're fattened up for slaughter, okay? So they're probably out in a pasture grazing grass until they reach a certain age where they'll be taken to this CAFO where they will be confined. They won't be using a lot of energy and they'll fed a high fat, um, high protein and fat diet of corn and they'll be fattened up before slaughter, all right? Um, these are often very crowded and very high population densities. Whenever you know that there's a high population density, you should immediately think disease. Disease can spread super easily among these organisms, whether that's a respiratory virus or a fecal coliform bacteria, whatever it is, it can spread super fast. So they tend to use lots and lots of antibiotics, not just to treat the sick, but as a preventative. So they use preven um, antibiotics as preventatives. And they use lots of other chemicals, including disinfectants um, between, um, between harvests or between lots, okay? Um, animals are fed grains or concentrated pellet feed. These are typically nutrient inferior to their natural diet, okay? And in some cases, the animals aren't even um, adapted to eat those grains. Cows are supposed to eat grass. They don't eat grain, okay? Very rarely in nature, and in, in a pasture setting would a cattle eat a grain. They typically eat grass. However, this is very inexpensive. Government subsidies and um, efficient use of space and all of that means that it's um, very inexpensive, so it's cheap meat for the consumer. And that is why 98% of the meat in the U.S. comes from a CAFO. And I should also point out that this includes cage-free eggs. If you don't specifically see that they're free range, cage-free means that they're CAFOs. Okay, you just don't have the little chickens in cages. Um, you have them in a large um, chicken house like this, and there you got to have somebody going in there and picking up the eggs every single day. Finally, I skipped this bullet point, but this creates a huge amount of organic waste that has to be disposed of. That very concentrated area, right? It can run off in a heavy rain event um, into surface water. It they typically, and they always um, rather, have um, lagoons, artificial pools that they um, that they dump all this waste into, into an aqueous solution. It smells like high heaven. Um, so nasty smelling. Um, and then, it has to be disposed of at some point. Typically it's sold to farmers um, to be sprayed on their fields, but a lot of the time it's just dumped into the nearest river. Um, it's the easiest way to dispose of it. I'll show some pictures in class of those, or if you're at home, you can see those, but I believe the next slide. But I thought I would share this quote from you from Wolf, Rado, Wolf Ralph Waldo Emerson. Jeez, um, he was a vegetarian and um, he did have a problem with eating meat on a moral level.
Um, and I really do like this quote, you have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in the graceful distance of miles, there is complicity. Meaning that any time that you eat meat, you are complicit into, in the, um, the killing and the butchering and the, um, the, uh, of an animal and the whole process of um, these CAFOs, unless you're eating right free range meat, in which case you're just complicit in the slaughtering and butchering of the animal. And yeah, never mind. I'm, 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 I'll save the next part for class. All right. So this this is the article that I mentioned. If you want to see what these um, what these uh, waste lagoons look like, I'll show these in class as well as some others using Google Earth. Truly mind blowing. And I'll link it in the in, in the description below. So for many reasons, CAFOs are bad. However, if we continued to eat the same amount of meat worldwide, we would need way more land area if we were to switch everything to free range than we would for CAFOs. So if we want to get rid of CAFOs, um, which I'm in the camp of doing, but you know, you may not, just personal choices, um, there's not enough room on the planet to do so sustainably. Okay, um, so in Overall, we need to limit our consumption of, of meat, okay? Um, one of the problems with uh, free range, if not done properly, is overgrazing, okay? So you can free range and that can still lead to overgrazing because you're not managing that land sustainably. Um, this is essentially the loss of vegetation um, of an area. You're, the, the animals are, are completely eating all of the plants in that area. It's leading to um, the soil being exposed to the drying effects of the sun and the wind, being um, able to erode by wind action and by water action. Okay, And it can possibly lead to desertification, the shifting of whatever biome it was to desert. Again, we talked about um, the 10% rule and um, trophic levels. I'll let you read this, but I'm not going to explain it because we already explained it. And we'll just get to some of the negative, other negative impacts of eating meat um, and these graphs. So first off, meat production is the largest use of fresh water worldwide. Um, doesn't matter what crop you're using, water requirements um, are huge for meat because you have to grow the plants to feed to the animals, not just um, grow the plants, right? You also have to have the animals having access to fresh drinking water all the time. So if we're looking at water requirements per gram of protein, and you should note that um, different crops have different amounts of proteins, a starchy root vegetable like a potato has very little protein. So in order to get um, in order to get a gram of protein, you have to have lots and lots and lots and lots of potatoes. So that's why starchy roots is pretty high. But you'll notice that beef per gram of protein is about 112 liters. Okay, um, and the FRQ that we saw, it was 113, close enough. Sheep and goat, second highest, then pig, and then chicken. So for the FRQ um, that we saw, again, um, just shifting from beef to a less water intensive crop or um, um, meat source can be a way to reduce the negative um, impacts of just water use on the planet. Okay, but um, you'll notice that pulses, a pulse is a legume, is a very efficient water or very water efficient way to um, get your protein. Eggs, milk, same thing because you're not killing the animal every time, you're allowing that animal to live and uh, produce more through its lifetime. And then per calorie, you see basically the same story. Some of these other ones are shifted a little bit. Uh, you'll notice that nuts are pretty high because nuts are pretty water intensive, especially almonds, um, but they're very high in proteins and not quite as, and fats, but not quite as high in carbs. So, you, so the the um, amount per kilocalorie is is um, higher because you need more nuts for calories, right? Okay. So, and then you notice that starchy roots is way at the bottom because they're basically nothing but calories. But same thing you see is that meat is pretty darn high throughout. And then we can look at the greenhouse gas emissions um, per 100 grams of protein from eating meat. Um, greenhouse gas emissions is super high for our ruminants. So we're looking at beef and lamb. Um, sorry, beef and uh, um, goats and sheep. Um, I think lamb would just be sheep. Mutton is sheep. Um, I don't even see goats on here. So maybe they do include goats in that. Um, 
But regardless, meat is going to be very high for greenhouse gas emissions, especially our ruminants, because they're producing methane through enteric fermentation, which you guys should remember from our carbon cycle PowerPoint. Okay, um, not only are we creating um, methane from this, but we're also creating carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, or sorry, um, nitrous oxide, yeah, um, and carbon monoxide. So all of these do have greenhouse gas emissions related to them because of the the um, the uh, agricultural practices, the machinery that we use, the greenhouses that we use. That's why tomatoes are so high. Um, but meat production, especially beef, is super high. So again, eating meat is a personal choice, but it does come with um, land, water, um, pollution, um, problems and even human health effects. Okay, so just keep that in mind as you decide to eat meat or not. Um, one of my hunting and fishing buddies is big on that being a viable alternative. We do not have enough wild animals on the planet to sustain human populations as they are at 8 billion. So that's not a viable alternative. What is a viable alternative, like I said before, is eating lower on the food chain. Um, again, this is eating more plants and mushrooms um, because mushrooms are a fungus and not a plant. Um, and, you know, even seaweed being an algae, being a protist is not a plant, but eating um, lower on the food chain, eating um, plants primarily is one way to reduce those water um, requirements, those land requirements, and those um, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. If you were to decide to just eat um, less meat, that's great. Okay. So say that you eat half the amount of meat that you do today. Okay. Um, that would be a 50% reduction in water usage, land usage, and um, carbon, or carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions um, from just your personal consumption of meat. If you were to completely eliminate meat, that'd be vegetarian diet. Most vegetarians or many vegetarians still eat um, different organisms. They can eat eggs, um, for example. Some vegetarians are piscatarians, meaning that they're only eating fish, but no other um, animal product or even maybe fish and eggs. And you can have a huge greenhouse gas emission um, reduction just by going vegetarian. Vegan means that you have no animal products whatsoever. Um, like whatsoever. So that's eaten, worn, etc. So no leather, no wool, etc. Um, the potential greenhouse gas reduction from that is about 70%. And both of those are from that book called Drawdown, which we've talked about before. And you guys will read some more articles out of. All right, so I'll get off of my high horse talking about uh, meat consumption for a little bit. And let's talk about GMOs. Um, GMO stands for genetically modified organism. This is any organism that has its genetic information uh, manipulated using genetic engineering practices in a laboratory setting. OK, um, essentially what you do is either edit the genome. OK, so you um, snip, remove, alter areas of the genome and that makes it genetically modified because you have modified it at a genetic level in the lab. Okay, gene editing would just be if you have um, if you're if you're um, keeping the genome otherwise intact, right? So you're not introducing the genome or a protein or sorry a gene sequence from another organism. Transgenic is when you are introducing a gen gene sequence from another organism. So that's where that word trans comes from. So other meaning transgenic um, gene from another organism. That would be like the example that I talked about before with uh, Bacillus thuringiensis bacterial gene in corn genome. Okay, we have input that into the corn genome. Okay, you can put a wheat protein into rice. You can put um, a, you know, a uh, one fish um, species protein into sam uh, into a salmon species. There's many ways that you can do this. Okay, crops can be modified for a variety of purposes, including any of these. Um, again, we talked about that. Uh, sorry, not herbicide, but pest resistance um, for uh, GM corn for um, BC. I'm uh, sorry, BT corn. Roundup ready corn though is huge. So that's herbicide resistance. Um, herbicide resistance, 
essentially means that you're resistant to an herbicide, in this case, Roundup. Roundup is glyphosate produced by uh, what was Monsanto and that was Bayer um, Chemical Company. And it essentially means that you can spray this weed killer called Roundup on your field and kill every single um, weed in that field, but it will not affect your corn. So there is a gene in that that um, makes it Roundup ready with air quotes around it, uh, meaning that the Roundup will not kill your corn. They have Roundup ready um, corn, soy, uh, cotton, um, variety of different crops. Okay. You can also increase the nutrient content of your crops. So that's what I have up here. This is something called golden rice. And one problem with rice is that it's very low in vitamin A. Vitamin A, um, pretty sure it's vitamin A, beta carotene, um, is uh, what contributes the gold or orange or red color to many different um, foods, think carrots. Okay, so increasing the nutrient content of um, rice in this example. The use of GMOs is controversial worldwide. Some, um, some entities, uh, governmental entities, um, accept it, some ban it. The European Union, for example, has virtually outlawed GMOs before they um, could assess the negative health um, impacts, if any, of GMOs. The U.S., on the other hand, um, about 92% of corn in the U.S. is GMO. Okay. Um, I do want to point out this is a huge misconception that artificial selected selection selective breeding is a form of genetic modification. It is absolutely not. Selective breeding is just um, choosing the plants or animals, the traits that we desire in those plants and animals to pass on to the next generation, okay? You allow your strongest horse to breed so that your horses over many generations can become stronger. Or you allow, um, you choose the biggest seeds from the best producing wheat plants to survive and go to the next generation so that your next generation of um, wheat kernels are slightly larger. And that happens year after year after year, generation after generation. GMO is a lab process. It happens in the laboratory. Okay, so it's not the same thing at all, even though um, they both result in uh, improving crops at a genetic level. All right, some negative impacts of GMOs. Um, both environmental and otherwise. First off, GMOs can escape into the wild populations and breed with the wild populations and introduce new genes into those wild populations. Salmon is an example of that. So we have genetically modified salmon that, can't, that are being raised in fish farms. If they happen to escape those aquaculture settings, they can breed with wild populations of salmon and introduce those genes into the wild population. And therefore, um, Therefore, uh, as long as that wild population survives with those genes, forever altering it at a genetic level. Okay, but it can happen with um, any organism where there is a domestic and wild population that can potentially interbreed. All right, uh, Roundup ready crops um, and other crops such as uh, these ones being sprayed by lasso uh, can have chemical residues on the um, on the leaves or on the other crop surfaces. Okay, so if you are eating them, you can have very, very small amounts of these um, of these uh, pesticides. Okay, um, we have an increased dependence on these synthetic pesticides and herbicides. If you're spraying Roundup Ready crops, you are um, you are 100% have to buy Roundup. Otherwise, there was no point in doing it. You're not going to manually weed your field. You're going to spray Roundup. So you are therefore completely dependent on that pesticide. Okay, these GMOs are patented technology. This one is pretty big. Those seeds are proprietary. That is um, especially the case in the United States. It's really um, odd in my, uh, in my opinion because I'm one of those gardeners that saves seed. So gardeners, farmers for thousands of years have been saving their seeds to plant the next generation. Okay, if you raise wheat, you would not eat all of your wheat. You would not mill all of your wheat down to flour. You would mill down 75, 80% of it down to flour and eat that part, but you'd have to save 20, 25% or however much amount to plant the next year. In fact, there are old stories like from medieval Europe of, um, of uh, villages going through a famine and people literally starving to death and them still reserving um, part of the crop part of last year's crop to plant the next year. You had to, to survive. Okay. So I'd like to do it at home because um, it's a great way to save money, right? But 
um, these GM seeds are proprietary. Many of them are self-terminating, meaning that, they're that they produce sterile seeds the next generation, so you literally cannot use them um, to, uh, to replant the next year. But even if you do save seed from ones that are not sterile, self-terminating, um, you can be sued by the company that owns those seeds because they are proprietary. So by saving them, you are in breach of contract and, uh, and therefore um, can be taken to court. So there's um, a lot of lawsuits um, for Monsanto alone, 145 lawsuits, 11 through to trial, all of which Monsanto has won based off of the proprietary technology of their seeds. And in fact, there are some cases where um, you have one corn or sorry one field of corn that is gmo and your next door neighbor is um let's say old school um heirloom variety and the corn um, pollen because corn is when pollinated has blown onto that other field you now introduce the gm um, gene or sorry the, the genes from the gmo into this field and the seeds the next year have Monsanto's gene in it. It is proprietary, and this farmer can no longer save their seed. Otherwise, they go, would go to court. Okay, Monsanto has won all those cases. And again, Monsanto is now Bayer Chemical Company. Um, and then there's the, law, the cancer lawsuits. Um, we're just looking at Monsanto, but there's many um, pesticide companies. And right now, just um, from Monsanto use, Bayer, again, is the current owner of Monsanto, currently appealing for a settlement of $10.9 billion in reparation for Roundup-related cancers. This is as of December 2021, so I'm about a year behind on this court case, but that's okay. Um, this is for over 100,000 lawsuits. Okay, it may be picked up by the Supreme Court. Again, I haven't followed it, I'm not sure. Um, I should check that out before class. Okay, um, if they can spend $16 billion to fight this lawsuit, they are making lots and lots and lots of money. Okay, and in general, if this guy has to take this level of precaution to handle this pesticide in a concentrated form, I don't want any of that, con uh, any of that pesticide in even a diluted form in my food or in my body or in the air that I'm breathing. So let's look at a couple other things that are a little bit more of an extension, um, organic versus organic, okay? Um, first off, students every year ask about this um, once we talk about all the negative impacts, so I thought I would include it in this PowerPoint. Um, the organic movement, um, grew out of the post-World War II petrochemical buzz and the TV dinner craze of the 1960s and was really part of the hippie counterculture, okay? People wanted to return to the earth, people wanted to eat real food and not whatever kind of crap that is, okay? So they attempted to mimic natural systems, they attempted to, wait, um, to change the way that Americans ate um, in terms of eating real food and not processed food, okay? And because of this um, this idea, they forbade the use of using synthetic anything, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, anything. They wanted to farm like people would farm in um, the pre-industrial societies. Because they knew that their food would be clean. They knew that their food would be free of all of these um, you know, potentially cancer-causing chemicals. I can't say cancer-causing because I might be flagged or something, but um, potentially cancer-causing chemicals, etc. cetera. Okay? Um, the demand for these grew, okay? The demand for this skyrocketed to where in the early 1990s, um, the USDA had to define organic for, this, for the consumer. And they, their definition wasn't 100% um, what the hippies in the 60s and 70s wanted it to be, okay? Um, they set strict guidelines and essentially what you cannot use is any synthetic pesticide or fertilizer. It doesn't mean that it has to be sustainably grown. So you can use factory farms, those factory farms aren't using any synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. Okay, it can be large monocultures, um, even though those large monocultures can damage the soil and you can use some damaging techniques such as flame weeding, um, using fire to weed um, your plants, which is um, technically not using synthetic pesticides or herbicides, okay? Um, you can still use intensive plowing. You can still use large chicken, hog, or cattle houses, even if it's not at that CAFO level. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it's sustainable. Okay. However, it is on the whole a lot better than um, traditional factory farming. And you, you, if you so desire, I would highly recommend that you look for anything that's labeled USDA organic because it's definitely going to be, you know, at least pesticide herbicide free. Okay. If you are buying food that is not labeled um, organic or free range or whatever it is, you can just basically assume that it was grown in the industry uh, in the in the industrial agricultural system. Okay. Or you're growing your own, you know. So modern agriculture, mostly unsustainable. Okay, we use a huge amount of resources, whether that is groundwater, surface water, um, the soil that we use, the nutrients in the soil that we don't want to erode off, the fossil fuel use, etc. Sustainable agriculture, though, has been used in practices worldwide for thousands of years, and it has been improved on with modern science, modern understanding of natural systems. For sustainable agriculture, we're going to focus on maintaining and improving soil quality. So we want our soil to not just be maintained, but improved year after year after year after year. And we can use all types of organic fertilizers to do that. We can use green manure, animal manure. We can use compost, which feeds the soil. We can use um, inorganic um, fertilizers like limestone, um, you know, ground up limestone as a source of uh, calcium, you know, not, not used in every um, case, but, you know, if you want to reduce the pH of your soil and introduce calcium, there you go. We focus on conserving water, again, at a sustainable rate, so using extracting water at a rate equal to or less than it naturally recharges. We can do crop rotation or rotational grazing. Essentially what that means is that we have several fields or you have several garden beds or whatever it is, um, and you rotate your crops year after year after year. I believe that we've talked about this before, but it's been quite a while, but say that we grow um, lettuce in our field year one and tomatoes year two, and then, um, and then uh, legumes like uh, peas year three or beans year three to replace that nitrogen that's been lost. And then maybe we have a cover crop of uh, buckwheat on year four, and that buckwheat will replace some of the phosphorus that has been lost. And then you just keep ro rotating those year after year after year, um, making sure that you return those nutrients to the soil via those organic sources. And you also don't grow the same thing in the same soil year after year after year to allow the pests of that specific crop to build up in that area on that field. Rotational grazing would just add animals into that, or you have one field that you allow your animals to graze, and then they move on to the next field, and then the next field, and then the next field, and you will, and by the time they return to the first field, the grass has grown again, and they can um, go back to that. And then obviously free-range animals without overgrazing. Okay, um, this is closely aligned to the original sense of what organic agriculture meant, not the USDA definition from the 90s. Okay, however, many the, this this would get the USDA um, um, stamp on it. One of the methods of um, sustainable agriculture that we're going to um, that we're going to talk about is called permaculture. Um, again, this is both a philosophy and a practice that attempts to model ecosystems. And there's many different types of permaculture, many different setups for permaculture, but you are going to model it off of nature. You're going to use um, natural systems as your as your um, as your blueprint okay you're going to catch and store as much organic matter and as much um, water as you possibly can you're going to catch and store as much energy as you possibly can via sunlight okay um, emphasis on renewable resources so you're not going to use fossil fuels and you aim to produce no waste and the wastes that you do produce are used in the system so animal waste crop waste would go back into compost and soil okay um, you often see that you interplant so you grow many crops together um, and you don't have a monoculture um, really ever okay and you have lots and lots of diversity that dozen plus species that we talked about at, at, on one of the first slides okay and this is just one model of it where you have um, kind of a, a progressively um, 
fields moving out away from your settlement. So let's say that we have um, a little settlement with your people. Your first zone would be um, just your herbs and your vegetables that you would use on a daily basis. Um, and then your second zone would be your somewhat cultivated crops, your market crops, your greenhouses, your, uh, your, your some maybe a field of uh, wheat or something like that. Um, zone three would be something like your uh, fruit orchard or your um, your bramble bushes for your berries, um, your pasture for your cattle, something like those. Your fourth field, and you notice that we're moving progressively into a more natural system, would be wild gather food, um, pasture, maybe wood cuttings for fuel or timber. When we talk about wild gather food, maybe like mushrooms or berries or something. And then finally, an unmanaged zone of wilderness where you can still forage for mushrooms. You can still go out there for cultural services. Okay, And all of those would provide habitat for a variety of organisms, organisms that don't like being around humans versus organisms that are very tolerant of being around humans. Okay, And those organisms are going to often provide um, services in our, um, in our uh um, in our gardens and our fields as well, like we talked about with the sparrows or the ladybugs or um, anything else. So let's talk about how this system can change. Um, this system is one of the, the agricultural system is one of the bigger lobbyers in um, the U.S. government, and we're just going to focus on the U.S. here. Um, they're very heavily subsidized and they are very resistant to any type of change. The change that happens has to come from a ground roots level um, and it, or sorry, grassroots level, sorry, not ground roots, grassroots level, and it has to be um, from the individual consumer, right? You vote with your dollar in this case, or you shift to growing some or much of your own food, okay? And I like this quote to, um, to talk about this. Every time you spend money, you cast a vote for the type of world you want, okay? So this really is voting with your dollar. If you want to be complicit with the factory farming um, culture that we have in the United States, by all means, just go and buy the heavily processed um, or factory farm meat from Keen Supers or wherever you buy your food from. But if you want to be part of the solution, look for the organic label, look for free range, um, eliminate or reduce or eliminate eating meat, um, grow a garden at home. Any of those would help um, change this system. And I'm gonna end this with um, a quote for Norman Borlaug. I told you that we'd re be returning to him. Um, this is quoted from his Nobel Peace Prize lecture. And I've, I've linked the entire Peace Prize lecture here, his speech at the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 here, because it is really good and, and, and I recommend reading it. Um, but the Green Revolution has won a temporary success in man's war against hunger and deprivation. It has given man a breathing space. If fully implemented, the revolution can provide sufficient food for sustenance during the next three decades. Okay, enough food for the next three decades. We are obviously past that, right? That ended in, two, in the year 2000. But the frightening power of human reproduction must also be curbed. Again, we're talking about everything is coming to human population numbers. And right now we're at 8 billion. Numbers that Norman Borlaug did not see in his lifetime. Otherwise, the success of the Green Revolution will be ephemeral only, okay? Because we're talking about growing the same amount of, or sorry, growing more food on the same amount of land, okay? Um, there is going to come a point where we're going to run out of space, run out of arable land to grow food. And we better be able to sustain the human population before we get to that point, right? So we need to keep curb human population growth or else the effects of this are going to be short-lived. Most people still fail to comprehend the magnitude and menace of the population monster. Since man is potentially a rational being, I really like that part. Um, however, I am confident that within the next two decades, he will recognize the self-destructive course he steers along the road of irresponsible population growth and will adjust the growth rate to levels which will permit a decent living standard for all mankind. I would argue that we did not hit that benchmark, that we did not, that we have not reached that goal yet. We have not curbed um, the human population growth rate and that we still do not have a decent living standard for all of mankind. Okay, so kind of connecting tragedy of the commons to this um, idea of food production here. And it's really, um, I think, um, prophetic that he said this in 
um, first off a Nobel Peace Prize lecture, but then also in the year 1970, that we, that we have not reached this goal. Anyway, I am done lecturing. Um, this PowerPoint is, or this video is already over two hours long. So uh, I'll let you guys read through the learning objectives if you want to. I'll put them all up here, but um, learning objective after learning objective after learning objective. All right, that's it. If you were absent from class, I'm sorry that you had to sit through a two-hour lecture. Um, I hope that you guys learned something, and I'll see you all in class. Bye-bye.